Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this year's Raiders of the Lost Oscars. Please welcome your hosts, James and Anthony Devaney. Thank you, thank you all so much. Welcome to the first annual Raiders of the Lost Oscars. We are so excited and beyond humbled to be the first ever hosts of this illustrious ceremony. What an honor. When Anthony and I first thought about moving to Los Angeles, never could we have imagined that we'd be hosting an imaginary awards show in the guest house of our home. But look at us now. We made it, we made it, man. And like any award show, James and I are going to open up with a series of jokes that we wrote for today's show. 2021 was a terrific bounce back year at the box office after 2020 hit a 40 year low because of global lockdowns and COVID. Even with Omicron cases on the rise, people still went to the theater this winter to see Spider-Man No Way Home. <laughs> Everything else just bombed as it raked in $1.5 billion. Timothy Chalamet in Call Me By Your Name director Luca Guadagnino are making a movie about cannibals. Army Hammer has openly criticized the casting for not being inclusive enough to real cannibals. <laughs> <laughs> James Bond died for the first time in the history of cinema. After killing 611 people, including himself, fathering 89 children across 52 countries, and awaiting his turn for admittance into heaven, even Jesus was like, bruh, what the f***? Also, Bond clearly had time to die in that movie. No time to die, definitely had time. <laughs> Scarlett Johansson sued Disney this year after they changed Black Widow's release to a rental, netting them 100% of the VOD profits, proving once again that there's nothing a giant corporation enjoys more than paying women less than they deserve. <laughs> The much-anticipated sequel to the horror film Don't Breathe came out in 2021. It was called Don't Breathe 2. Keep holding your breath. <laughs> <laughs> that one that's kills me one. every time. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> we finally got our first Marvel Asian superhero with Shang-Chi in The Legend of the Ten Rings. And Marvel proved that they care deeply about being inclusive to Asians. So deeply that they waited 25 movies to be inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> At least they did it. <laughs> 2021 was the year of the soft reboot, including Mortal Kombat, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Candyman, Space Jam, A New Legacy, The Matrix Resurrections, Resident Evil, Snake Eyes, Geo Joe Origins, Scream in 2022, and also please tune into Raiders of the Lost Podcast Origins prequel, which will premiere April 5th and star Lily Collins and Natalia Dyer in our female reboot. Wait till you see the post credit scene. <laughs> <laughs> After forgetting about Andrew Garfield's existence for the last eight years, fans are in love with him once again after his breakout role in Spider-Man No Way Home, proving that people don't really give a f about actors until they're in a Marvel movie. <laughs> I love how you call it his breakout role. <laughs> <laughs> the film Pig stars Nicolas Cage as a retired world-class chef who has moved to the woods to hunt truffles and finds love with a pig. And you thought you started getting desperate during lockdowns. <laughs> with Space Jam A New Legacy, LeBron James showed the world once again why he is always second best to Michael Jordan by making the second best Space Jam movie. Ooh, what a burn. <laughs> Despite starring in this year's biggest hit with Spider-Man No Way Home, Tom Holland's other film, Chaos Walking, was the biggest flop of the year, earning only $13 million against a budget of $125 million, proving once again that people don't really give a fuck about actors until they're in a Marvel movie. <laughs> Now, before we get into the award ceremony, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast, where you get awesome perks like our podcast schedules, personalized videos, Patreon shoutouts on the show for top tier and Godfather tier patrons, as well as weekly bonus episodes and Godfather tiers. They get an extra bonus episode every month, as well as free stickers and some other cool stuff. We just launched our podcast masterclass online course yesterday. For so, so for anyone who wants to start a podcast or wants to improve their current podcast, our 22 chapter 
46 lesson video course will give you all the secrets behind the scenes of our show. The link is podcastmasterclass.teachable.com or just go to our website, raidersofthelostpodcast.com. It's right there on the homepage. You can also see all of our sources of content, our merch, our custom movie posters. Please follow, subscribe wherever you're listening and watching. Hit the notification bell and let's get back into Raiders of the Lost Oscars. And so the first award we're going to be presenting today is going to be Best Actor in a Supporting Role. We had a bunch of great, great nominees and performances great, great this year. year. But the nominees for this category are Cody Smith McPhee for The Power of the Dog, Troy Kotzer for Coda, Jamie Dornan for Belfast, Alex Hassel for The Tragedy of Macbeth, Adam Driver for The Last Duel, and Benicio Del Toro for The French Dispatch. And the Oscar goes to Alex Hassel for The Tragedy of Macbeth. He was just really a standout in this film. He was terrific. Um, he plays like a villainous, heroic character. At the same time, he's kind of ambiguous morally, and you don't know who side he's on fully for the entire film. And I think he just did a terrific job. I'd never really seen him in a movie before, but he's a big Shakespeare Shakespearean and theater actor. He looks familiar, but I don't think I recalled seeing him in a movie. And he, when I was watching the movie, he kept standing out in every scene that he acted in, even when Denzel's in the scene as well. And he really stole the screen and was a really terrific performer in this amazing cast. So I think that among all these great nominees, Alex Hessel was really the best performer this year. Next up, we have Best Original Screenplay. The nominees for this category are Paul Thomas Anderson for Licorice Pizza, Kenneth Branagh for Belfast, Julia Ducournau, Jackie Akochi, Simonetta Greggio for Titani, Aaron Sorkin for Being the Ricardos, and John Krasinski for A Quiet Place Part 2. And the Oscar goes to Kenneth Branagh for Belfast, which is one of my favorite films of the year. A really beautiful portrait of family in a, riff, in a difficult time of their lives in, in the horrible time of Ireland. And I think that Kenneth Branagh made his best film of his career. Yeah, and he went up against some of the best screenwriters working in cinema today. We're talking about Aaron Sorkin, Paul Thomas Anderson. I mean, their films are just iconic, especially Sorkin, who's written some of the best scripts this entire century. So Kenneth Branagh really knocked it out of the park with this film so far. I wouldn't be surprised if it wins a couple other awards. Who knows? We'll find out in a little bit. We'll have to see. Next up, we have Best Adapted Screenplay. The nominees are Nicole Holof Center. Matt Damon and Ben Affleck for The Last Duel. Jane Campion, The Power of the Dog. Maggie Gyllenhaal for The Lost Daughter. Guillermo del Toro for Nightmare Alley. Coda for Sean Hader. Drive My Car for Yusuke Hamaguchi and, Ta and Takamasa O. Oh. And the winner of the Best Adapted Screenplay Oscar is for Nicole Hall of Center, Matt Damon, and Ben Affleck for The Last Duel. Congratulations. So Matt and Ben hadn't worked on a film in terms of writing and since The Goodwill Hunting. You know, that script won them an Oscar as well as they boomed into Hollywood overnight, almost like seeming like Sprouted a- like flowers. Like a success within a couple of days because of that movie. And then having Nicole Hall of Center was integral to this film because The Last Duel, as we talked about in our review of it, takes place over the storylines being told by three different characters, two male and one female. And so they knew it would be in central, essential to the film to have a female screenwriter write the parts of uh, Jodie Comer's characters, part of her truth and her side of the story. Yeah, it was a really terrific screenplay. It was, by, I think, by far the best written screenplay of the year, even including the original screenplays. And Matt, and da Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, plus Nicole, her contributions, was actually vital because of the female perspective she brought to the film. I thought that it was really sensational writing, and it's a shame it hasn't gotten enough recognition this year because of how poorly it did at the box office. But uh, we've recommended this movie in many episodes, and if you have not seen it, make this the one of the next one you watch. Yeah, I think the last two, I'd put it in my top five, maybe top three of the year. It's it my was top that three. good. I mean, yeah. the, the acting was phenomenal. Again, the screenplay, the, the, the story is complex because... Each it's sort of in it's three acts obviously, but each one's telling the same story from a different perspective of a character, and I and you have to do that in three different ways so that you don't bore the audience, you don't retell the same thing the same way. So it's a really difficult task, and I think they pulled it off so so well. Yeah, because the same scenes are occurring from each perspective, but that different point of view of how each scene plays out is so fascinating. Next up, we have best actress in a supporting role. The nominees for this category are Ariana DeBose for West Side Story, Kirsten Dunst for The Power of the Dog, Ruth Nega for Passing, Frances McDormand for The Tragedy of Macbeth, 
and Wani Ellis for King Richard, and Marley Matlin for Coda. And the Oscar goes to Ariana DeBose for West Side Story. Really terrific performance supporting the rest of this cast. Amazing voice. She really pulled off the dance numbers really well. And she was a standout in every scene that she was involved in. Oh, for sure. But we also had some, some incredible performances as well. Marley Matlin was so, so good in Coda. She's already won an Oscar before in the past. Um, and then Frances, obviously, she's tremendous in the tragedy of Macbeth going scenes together with Denzel. Ruth was phenomenal in passing. I highly recommend that if you haven't seen it yet. And obviously, Kirsten is such an incredible actress, even though she's been in big franchises like Spider. Man, I think people forget about that for sure. Absolutely. Next up, we have Best Sound Editing. The nominees are Dune, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Eternals, No Time to Die, and A Quiet Place Part 2. And the Oscar goes to No Time to Die. Now, this was a difficult award to give because there are some really great films in, when, with sound editing that were off the charts like dune was an incredible experience especially if you saw this in imax and you really f listened and heard the audio to the full potential with that sound system there it was absolutely incredible but no time to die was incredible as well but also a quiet place when not to use sound when to use sound that was also so integral to that film as well yeah i just think no, no time to die knocked it out of the park in terms of like the visceral quality of the action sequences uh, you could feel the environments uh, from all the locations they were filming in. I think the production, the Foley art, uh, everything about it was really incredibly well done. And I think it was really stood out when you watch this film in a theater. Next up, we have Best Sound Mixing. And now the difference for any of you who are confused between sound mixing and sound editing is sound mixing is the final mix of a film. So the people who are in charge of balancing out every sound that was used for the production to make it a perfect balance level for the audience to enjoy in a theater. Now, the nominees are Dune, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Last Night in Soho, West Side Story, No Time to Die, and A Quiet Place Part 2. And the Oscar goes to West Side Story. They did a phenomenal job of combining both the music, uh, the singing, and the actual audio production and on, uh, audio effects in a wonderful way, especially for the uh, intense action sequences. They really knocked this out of the park. It's a tremendous job by the entire team. Yeah, and I mean, Spielberg films, so obviously we're going to give it some recognition for sure, but Dune could have taken it easily. Last Night in Soho was a, was a great job as well. No Time to Die, obviously. Next up, we have Best Editing. The nominees are Last Night in Soho by Paul Matchless, Dune by Joe Walker, the Tragedy of Macbeth by Joel Cohen and Lucien Johnson. The Last Duel by Claire Simpson. Belfast by Una Ni Donghel. And A Quiet Place Part 2 by Michael P. Schauber. And the Oscar goes to Claire Simpson for The Last Duel. Now, again, same thing with adapted screenplay. This is a complex story where you're telling stories from three different perspectives. You're telling the same scenes over and over again, the same stories. And I think it's so important to have a great editor when you're making a film like this because again you don't want to be too repetitive you have to show things from different perspectives and this movie just flowed so well and just kind of just it, time didn't really matter to me when i was watching this it was like a little over two hours but i kind of wanted to go a little longer and again when you're watching three acts that are similar and to have it flow by like that and such a smooth performance from all the actors and everything it, it's just essential to have such a great editor and I think Claire did a, a tremendous job yeah it was almost three hours that's and it was two hours 45 and it, I felt like when it was over I was like I could keep watching this and she did a particularly incredible job with the action sequences you never felt lost you felt in constantly invested in what was going on practically on on screen and that final battle was so well crafted I was just like blown away by the compilation of the shots and her editing and I think that she is by far the best editor the editor this year with The Last Duel. Yeah, and especially what to show the audience, what not to show the audience in all these different scenes. So, terrific job by Claire Simpson. Next up, we have Best Visual Effects. The nominees for this category are Dune, Spider-Man No Way Home, No Time to Die, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Godzilla vs. King Kong, and The Tomorrow War. And the winner is Spider-Man No Way Home. Obviously Spider-Man. Yeah, I mean, these these scenes were gigantic and epic, and there were so much visual effects, and it all looked terrific. There was no moment where I was, like, taken out of it by at all. I think that they did a phenomenal job, 
and considering how much of the movie had visual effects, it's really impressive that they pulled it off. Yeah, and the third act was sensational, the visual effects and how great it looked. And spoiler warning, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm going to drop a spoiler in about three seconds. The visual effects Oscar for me just goes through it just to get the three Spideys jumping off the Statue of Liberty at the <laughs> same time and webbing together and landing together. That was the greatest visual effects shot of all time, probably. Yeah, it was pretty it, epic. It's up there. It's pretty pretty epic. I, I love the, uh, the, the, the Doctor Strange battle looked really great. Yeah, in the mirror yeah, room, for sure. That looked epic. And um, because someone's going to leave an unsubscribed comment, it was Godzilla vs. Kong. Oh, my bad. My you, your brain added King in there. I wrote Kong on the list. It's probably because I, uh, I hated that movie so much. <laughs> Unsubscribed! <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Best Makeup and Hair style- Styling. The nominees are Jana Carbani, Giuliani Mariano, Goran Lubstrin for House of Gucci, Nadia Stacy, Caroline Cousins for Cruella, Donald Mowat, Love Larson, Ava Von Barr, Dune, Linda Dowds, Stephanie Ingram, Justin Raleigh for The Eyes of Tammy Faye, Judy Chin, Kay Georgiou for The West Side Story, Cleona Fiore, Joanne McNeil for Nightmare Alley, and the Oscar for Best Makeup and Hairstyling goes to Nadia Stacy and Carolyn Cousins for Cruella. And just the, the makeup for this whole entire film was sensational. I love the way that um, Emma looked for the character of Cruella. The the hairstyling, is especially to the black and white look that it had and everything. Just, they knocked it out of the park with this movie. Yeah, and I think uh, so many times awards are given to a movie just for doing like crazy prosthetic work on an actor. Like Tammy Faye. Yeah, like Tammy Faye and, and um, Jared Gucci. Leto and House of Gucci. And that is that is amazing work, but I just think that the creativity in Cruella was the best this year That between the hair and the makeup combined. The hair, the hairstyles were fantastic, and Emma Stone's uh, uh, makeup was really sensational. I think that for creativity and artist, artistry, that Cruella was the best team. And it was so essential to the character of Cruella mm-hmm. on a different level than probably any other, other of these films, for sure. 100%. Before we continue, it's finally 2022, so now's the time to finally get your act together and get yourself groomed up for a new year, new you. So I recommend going to manscaped.com and getting their lawnmower 4.0 groomer using our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout, and you'll get 20% off and free shipping your entire order today. They're also launching a bunch of brand new products that we can finally talk about. So their Ultra Premium Collection is the ultimate wet goods bundle, which includes deodorant, yes, actual deodorant from Manscaped, body wash, two-in-one shampoo conditioner, hydrating body spray, which is a lotion that is also a spray. And the package also comes with a free set of Manscaped lip balm. So definitely get to manscaped.com, use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost for 20% off and free shipping off your entire order today. Get all these awesome new products and the Lawnmower 4.0 for your grooming needs. If you're a fan of movie posters, there's no better place to get your posters than at movieposters.com. Head on over to their website and use our special promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. Movieposters.com has all sorts of sizes, framing, backlight, and they have a selection of pretty much every single film and TV show imaginable at their fingertips. Again, if you need some movie posters for your place or for the film lover in your life, head on over to movieposters.com and use our special promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. It's a woman anyway, so... No, Wait. Patrice is a dude. Oh, never mind. It's a fucking dude. He's a fucking bra. <laughs> He's a bra, dude. <laughs> Next up, we have best... Oh, we're going an- intermission. I know. Oh, I sorry. Know. Next up, we have best animated feature. But before we go there, let's head on into our intermission. Oh, yeah. Let's have a little fun. Cruising through those lists. Jeez. This is, this is a lot of fun, though. All right. First up, we have our movie quote competition. This one's for me. And this, in turn, has given rise to the belief that there are no dwarf women and that dwarfs just spring out of the holes in the ground, which is, of course, ridiculous. Gimli in Fellowship of the Ring. Two Towers. Two Towers. Yeah. Oh. I, man, I missed... Yeah, yeah, you knew it was Gimli. I'll give you that. Yeah, but I got the movie wrong. It's incorrect. Good one. You threw me off. <laughs> All right, here's my quote. I thought I was a man. I had a life. People called me Cain. And now I'm not so sure. If I wasn't Cain... What was I? Was I you? Were you me? People called me Kane. 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 I used to think I was a man. It's not Blade Runner 2049. You said Kane, not K, right? Kane. Kane with a C or a K? K A N E. Kane. 
<laughs> like the wrestler. Like the wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Annihilation. Oscar Isaac's character. Good character. Good. Good. When he, good. When he returns home. Nice. I'm reviewing Ex Machina soon, FYI. Nice. Is it going to be an audio one? Audio one, yeah. Oh, I can't wait to hear. Yeah, thanks, man. It might have already premiered by the time this is aired. Oh, so nice. Check the feed, everybody. Was, so then that means it probably came out last Friday. Probably maybe. came out on like Saturday or oh, Friday. Saturday. Nice. All right. Guess movie release year. We own the night. We own the night with um, <clears throat> Maki Wak and... Maki and Wak? Wa- Maki Mak and Joaquin. <clears throat> I'm going to go with... 2006 2007 oh man it's a pretty cool movie it's cool it's pretty good I like it oh, it was almost good yeah it, it could have been great yeah. it could have been like yeah I mean you, ha- you have Joaquin film. as a as a wannabe mobster you know it's pretty cool alright guess this movie release here The Born Legacy oh, movie's trash it's not trash it's just not it's not the same as compared the other to the, tr- the original it's trilogy same, yeah but uh, if it's like it's own thing it's a pretty good movie I guess. I mean, I like Vincent Castle as the villain. Um, you Stalin? 2000. <laughs> I'm trying to think because the Jeremy Renner one came out like 2012-ish like or something like this that. This is the Jeremy Renner, Renner one. Oh, the Born thinking, Legacy. I was thinking, is the, what's the new one called? The huh? Born. Oh, just Jason Bourne. Oh, that's what was the, the fourth one was called? Yeah, that's the fourth Matt okay. one. Just Jason Bourne. Because so, you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Renner, Renner one. Okay, this one, eh, it's meh. Uh, 2013, 2012, 20. You were right. Was I? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you you went well. The random one came out in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the Jason Bourne, Jason Bourne is not good. Yeah, oh, man, what a letdown. Such a disappointment. And they had Paul Greengrass come back for it too, and everything. Yeah, they just had the same thing again. Another bunch of angry government guys are the bad guys again. It's just like okay, it was we the get same it. movie. Soft quiz. reboots, man. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our movie pop quiz. Ready for this one? Oh, I'm ready. Who has the most Oscars in their lifetime? <laughs> Who has won the most Oscars in their lifetime? That's a good question. I'm going to go with John Williams. Ah, eh. oh, damn. You can keep, keep guessing if you want. Thanks, I don't man. think you'll get it. <clears throat> it's going to be a producer. Someone who, who also produces movies is my guess. Um, I'll, I'll give you a hint. One of the most famous Americans to ever live. One of the most famous Americans to ever live. Ever. Ever. That's a pretty good hint. Ever. I don't know, man. Walt Disney. Oh. 22 wins in his lifetime as well as four honorary Oscars. So 26 total in his life. So yeah, a producer of movies. And film and maker. I think he wrote some and made some. Yeah, he, he was like the, like he directed all of them. He yes. didn't like direct direct them, but he was like the showrunner of Generational all Generational genius. Yeah. Good question. Thanks, man. It. Now it seems obvious. Now I feel like an idiot. I, I didn't want to say that. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's kind of like a trick question, almost yeah. like because he won all those awards year, decades ago, yeah. and like he won a bunch of awards for like short films and stuff like that. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, here's my quiz question: Who directed Annihilation? Oh, Annihilation! It's Alex Garland. Nice, <laughs> easy, good one. Thanks. Easy peasy for you. I'm a big fan of his. Yeah, he's a great great writer and director. Yeah, people don't know. He, he wrote a bunch of really good scripts before he was a director. Novels. In novels, yeah. too. He wrote 28 uh, Days, Days Later. Later. Yeah. Next up, our Godfather tier shout out of the episode is our good friend, Jacob Costler. He just upped his ante to Godfather tier, and we couldn't be more thankful. He actually does the sound mixing for our show, and we really appreciate everything he does for this. He is an amazing fan of the show. As well as friend of ours. On the day of our daughter's, daughter's wedding, wedding, you became Jacob. Jacob. The tier, Jacob. We made you an offer you couldn't refuse. Thank Jacob. you so much, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. He was also in our anime episode, which was a lot of fun to yeah. talk about. Yeah, if you want to see him talk about anime movies, that he, guy is he, legit. He knows a lot more than us yeah. in that <laughs> subject. A lot more. I was like, oh, yeah. What do you say? <laughs> Whatever you say, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who we got for, um, we got haters or unsubscribes? Yeah, we, we got, got it. We got a real hater. What we got going on, man? What we got? So... You made this really great Alfred Hitchcock clip talking about how when he um, bought the rights to Psycho, he actually bought every book of Psycho he could find. Thanks, man. That way he could um, prevent people from knowing the twist ending. And he purchased the rights to yeah. the book anonymously. Yeah, anonymously. So that way no less people could read the book and also nobody knew that he was making a movie about it. And it's really, really fascinating uh, tidbit about that movie. And then Jose Gahan had to write at this point, I truly can't find this account interesting anymore. 
literally. I'm so sorry. That unsubscribed. Uh, we've been time. A, we've been a pain in his life. <laughs> oh, another interesting fact about a filmmaker that I didn't know. Ugh. Uh, I can't take this. I can't give them anymore. one more chance. I can't take it anymore. No more chances, Raiders of Lust. I need podcast. to watch more people game on TikTok and just take selfie videos. No offense, if that's on TikTok, <laughs> but so we we produce some high quality content on there, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we would never make fun of gamers. This is thing, but hey, like, I used to be a gamer. Yeah, yeah, I used to be a gamer, but like this man, this guy, we're such a burden in his life. I, I'm so sorry that you have to pass on the show now, bud. <laughs> <laughs> And then we have uh, a couple unsubscribers. Um, for the Psycho episode, Will Smith wrote, can't even afford a colored camera. Unsubscribed. Because <laughs> we did Psycho black and white. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Christian Testa wrote, for absolutely no reason at all. Unsubscribed. <laughs> and then uh, uh, our fan of the week is Andy Gardner. He's been sending us a lot of great memes in the DMs, and he he deserves a shout out. So thanks, Andy. Thanks, Andy. All right. Uh, we have a couple of great five-star reviews that I want to share for supporters of this episode. First up, we have from Jacob Vincent 33 unsubscribe! <laughs> I love that's the first thing. <laughs> it's the title of the message. Absolutely love this podcast. Listening to these mates work flyby. Sorry, listening to these makes work flyby, and these two are genuinely funny and knowledgeable dudes who clearly love films. Never lifted a score of a soundtrack until I heard this podcast, and now I can't not do it. You're welcome. Hans yeah, Zimmer is once, the best music. Once you start listening to it, you can't, can't stop. That's all yeah. I listen to is movie yeah. scores. It's crazy. If you don't do an episode about best scores to work out to, I will unsubscribe. Wow, that's so <laughs> weird. I didn't even read that before. That's a great uh, episode idea. I would love to do that. Yeah, yeah my my workout. I have two different workouts. I have like my lifting one, then my running one. They're very different modes. Oh, I, I would love to hear about them. Similar crossovers for sure, but you know, uh -huh. there's a couple. Like I, lo I have a lot of Hans Zimmer deep track. Like uh, oh yeah, the this, long ones, the sketchbook tracks yeah, on my yeah, running yeah, one for sure. Ones. And I have, I have actually have a Hans Zimmer sweet playlist where I have like his long tracks on there. Nice, like from Man of Steel. Do you, do you just like have Spider a You have a poster of him too, of Hans Zimmer. Yeah. I should. I don't know why. Why don't you? I should get a poster of him and put it on my ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> then from Carter DeBlock, <laughs> my favorite podcast. This is definitely my favorite podcast. I always look forward to their new videos, and it makes my day when I see them release a new one. Thanks for, for thanks for providing such great conversations about some of the best movies and show. I could listen to you guys all day. Thanks so much, Carter. Thanks, Carter. Appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Wow, what such nice reviews. Nice guys. Wow, I can do this all day. It's been such a great day. <laughs> Today is January 4th, uh, 24th on this day in film history. <laughs> Speak of the devil and he shall appear. In 1927, Alfred Hitchcock releases his first film as a director, The Pleasure Garden. In 1940, The Grapes of Wrath is released, directed by John Ford. In 2003, Chicago is released. In 2020, The Gentleman was released. And happy birthday to the late Sharon Tate, Matthew Lillard, and Ed Helms. Ed Matthew Helms. Lillard's dead? Oh, I'm sorry. No, Sharon Tate's the late. <laughs> oh, my God. For some reason, I thought they were all obituaries. No, that's, that's chronological yeah, order yeah, of when yeah, they yeah. were born. Yeah, I'm a voting. And then Ed Helms. <laughs> it's just his birthday. The nard dog. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Little is dead? <laughs> Feel a little woozy here, Billy. <laughs> my parents are going to be so mad at me. For those who don't know, he's in Scream. We won't spoil who he is, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm an idiot. You my... really call it cops? <laughs> <laughs> my streaming recommendation for this episode is 12 Angry Men, which was recently added on Amazon Prime. Wow, what a film. The cinematography in that is so genius. That's great. In terms best of screenplay, like, one of the best screenplays ever. It takes place in one room, and yeah. then the camera, just the way it moves around the room, it's, oh, so, yeah. it's so good. Uh, my stream recommendation is A Taxi Driver. This is on Amazon Prime, coming from South Korea. Nice. Same uh, actor as in uh, Parasite. Yes. In many of Bong Joon-ho's films. He's a... I'm not going to pre pretend to try and announce it, pronounce his name. Well, that's your problem. Yeah. Anyways, let's move back into... Raiders of the Lost Oscars. Next up, we have Best Animated Feature Film. Nominees this year were Luca, Encanto, Raya and the Last Dragon, Flea, The Mitchells vs. the Machines, and Sing 2. And the winner this year was Encanto, which is a really terrific film. Amazing cast, really awesome songs. One of the songs has just taken over the world. It's become the number one song in America. What's it called? Uh, I can't remember. Oh, wow. It must be a big hit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm such bad with memories. I've only, I've only heard it when I watched the, watched the movie, but uh, it's a really wonderful film and really, really great cast. Yeah, this year had a bunch of great animated movies. I mean, this was stacked. The Mitchells vs. the Machines was also really good. I could have chosen seen that one as Raya well. Raya was good, too. Luca was excellent, but I think it just didn't have like as much heart as Encanto had, and I think it, I, didn't, like, I didn't have as much fun with it. I thought it was a good movie, and the animation was terrific, but I think Encanto was just on a different level than Luca. 
Congrats, Encanto. Next up, production design. The nominees were Patrice Vermette for Dune, Adam Stockison for The French Dispatch, Tamara Deverell for Nightmare Alley, Guy Hendricks Dias for Spencer, Stefan Dechant for The Tragedy of Macbeth, Florencia Martin for Licorice Pizza. In the Oscar goes to Patrice Vermette for Dune. Now, these nominees all knocked it out of the park. I mean, The French Dispatch, that was maybe Wes Anderson's most complex set film, like film set wise, that he's yeah. done before. Tons of great sets in production. Nightmare Alley was great. Spencer was obviously phenomenal. The tragedy of Macbeth, I haven't seen anything like that in a long time. Like that looked like it was straight from 80 years ago, but modern, modernized. Then Licorice Pizza was great as well. But I mean, Patrice Vermette, what he did with creating the world of Dune. He spent like two, three years doing that. He's been working on that since like 2017 when they started going into pre-production on it. And he's been working with Denise since I think the first film he did with him was Enemy. Oh, wow. A pretty long time ago. Quite the difference. Yeah, but he's been working. He's also responsible for the design of, of Arrival and then Blade Runner 2049 he worked on. But Dune, again, I think he even upped the ante and he upped their production from 2049, which is astounding as well. Yeah, and the reason why we didn't give Dune visual effects was because so much of the film was practically built. Exactly. All these sets were really built in these giant sound stages, and a lot of the exteriors, they're all filmed in exteriors. I really, one of my favorite sets is the landing pad, this gigantic area where all the ships are landing, and um, the way they lit it uh, was really fantastic, and all, just the, the design of the ships, the ornithopters, all the practical effects of each kind of society and what their um, production, what the production design, uh, design of each one of those worlds. You see three different worlds, th three different planets in this movie. Um, I just think that all in all, four it, planets. It's, oh, sorry, four planets. It was such a stunning production, and every single scene was like a mind blowing piece of an environment. And I was just like awestruck at this it's one of the best productions of the last 10 years easy of all time it maybe could, it could be up there for like the century yeah and for number one you know i can't wait to talk about this movie we have like a we're gonna do like a two three hour episode on dune very soon because we did our everything we know about dune before the film came out then we did a review for imax after it came out that was spoiler free it was only about 30 minutes yeah we didn't get very specific but when we analyze dune it's gonna take a while because there's just so much to talk about with the production design and stuff like the concept art and everything that patrice vermette and his team did as well and so i I'm ecstatic to talk about it. And again, these just watch it if you haven't seen it or watch it again if you have seen it and just look at the sets. They are massive, enormous pieces of art. It's all real. Even from like that giant when the, the ship lands from the from the Empire, the Empire ship. That was real shit. That, that, <laughs> <laughs> but like that gigantic carpet was really there. That huge green carpet was actually built for that scene. Yeah, they actually paved out a giant area at the studio. I, I believe in Jordan they were at this this mm. production studio and they paved like this giant outdoor area. They shot a lot of exteriors yeah. there. Amazing, amazing production. But yeah, we'll get deep into that when Real we do team. Dune. But Patrice Vermette, wow, what an amazing job with Dune. Next up, we have Best Costume Design. Our nominees are Jacqueline West for Dune, Milena Canarano, let me say that again, I'm sorry, Milena Canarano, The French Dispatch, Jenny Beaven for Cruella, Louis Sakira for Nightmare Alley, Jacqueline Duran for Spencer, and Mary Zoffers for The Tragedy of Macbeth. And the winner is Jacqueline West for Dune. Amazing, amazing job. Her, her craftsmanship of all the pieces in this it's not even just like the main characters pieces, but like there are so many other characters in this movie that don't have much screen time, but just their costume and their wardrobes are just so amazing. Like the people who represent the emperor, like their costumes were just, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And it was the next, it was like on the same level as that maybe if you saw Star Wars for the first time yeah. in the in the 70s, where you're like blown away by seeing this intergalactic style of clothing or fabrics and textures. It was that, um, revolutionary i think in terms of designing yeah what jacqueline did from taking the concept art and then expanding on that and making incredibly intricate and complex wardrobe for the fremen the still suits the benny Gesserit, lady jessica the military garb that the all the soldiers wear from for each army even the military uniforms for the houses just in, and even the getty prime characters and the harkonnens and everything absolutely Incredible job by the concept artist then Jacqueline West to bring it to reality. And also difficult things that could be done poorly, like in Lynch's uh, film, like, uh, for example, the Baron suit. Like, that could be done, like, really cheesy, but she did a great job of capturing something like that. 
Next up, we have Best International Feature Film. The nominees are Lamb, Drive My Car, Flea, The Worst Person in the World, The Hand of God, I'm Your Man, and Riders of Justice. Yeah. And the winner of this Oscar is Lamb. If you haven't seen this Icelandic, Icelandic film, it is tremendous. It's haunting. It's this weird dreamlike fairy tale that turns into a nightmare. It's coming from A24 and Numi Rapace stars in it. And wow, it was so, so terrific. It was a beautiful film. I mean, the, the, the cinematography alone was exceptional, very artistic and very mysterious and we had a blast watching this in cinemas in the, in the theater on the big screen. And also very funny, but also deeply disturbing. And just like you have never seen anything like it in your life. And it really still stuck with me. Like I th- like this movie is one of the movies of 2021 where it just like really stuck with me. And I still think about like, I'm like, oh my God, I still can't believe that movie even happened. It's so surreal, uh, so unique and original. And it's just like movies like that remind you like, oh man, you can really do anything with a film if you have the creativity. And it's everything you expect from a new A24 film. <laughs> yeah. I think it's the best way to put it. Absolutely. We're moving into the big guns now. Next up, we have best original score. It was a great year this year. So our nominees are Hans Zimmer for Dune, Nathan Johnson for Nightmare Alley, Alexandre Desplat for The French Dispatch, Johnny Greenwood for The Power of the Dog, Nicholas Bertel for Don't Look Up, and Daniel Hart for The Green Knight. And the Oscar goes to Dune. Hans Zimmer's amazing score for Denis Villeneuve's masterpiece. It's crazy this guy hasn't won an Oscar since... Uh, the Lion King, but now he has because we gave him an Oscar. <laughs> You're welcome, so you're Hans. welcome, Hans. It's been a long time. It's been almost 30 years, bro. <laughs> but this movie, uh, what he did is, again, revolutionary work. He he invented new sounds. He invented new instruments. He does what he always does, and he excels the movie that he's working on into the stratosphere and helps the movie reach its full potential. And I think that the, from the moment this movie starts and you hear the crazy drums during the opening credit, you're like, oh my God, this is insane. And then all like the the Harkonnen voices, like those weird chants and stuff and the mixture and elements of Middle Eastern instruments with electronics and the orchestra and the score. And it was just a wonderful experience. And it's my favorite thing to listen to from 2021. And when it was in the movie, Listening to that inside of a theater while you're watching it was just mind-blowing. Yeah, the best way I can describe Hans Zimmer's score for Dune, he actually made three of them. He made uh, a sketchbook, which is a bunch of great tracks, which some of are featured in the film. Then he, he made his main album for the movie. Denis Villeneuve says he's still making it. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> and he also made a third album, which is The Art and Soul of Dune, to accompany the book The Art and Soul of Dune, which is a really great behind-the-scenes look of how they made the film. And all three are unique and great, but the best way to describe them, I think, is it feels organic. It feels like it's alive, like it's real. Like I haven't heard a score for a movie like that since Johan Johansson's arrival. And that kind of feels like it's its own living organism, just like Dune's score by Hans Zimmer. Great point. I like that. Yeah. So they both feel like they're alive and they're part of the movie. They're part of the world. And I think he just knocked out of the park. And not to get like super nerdy, derny, doony on you, but it's actually the Sardaukar that are making those noises. Oh, Sardaukar, yeah. yeah the, the army sorry, of the, the emperor's the emperor. Emperor. Yeah, uh, no, I'm bad. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's like, it's like, <laughs> it's a pretty good impression. It's been all over TikTok. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah, yeah it, became, it became a trending noise. I'm going to have to see, you have to yeah, show me that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next up, Best Cinematography. The nominees are Greg Fraser for Dune, Ari Wagner, The Power of the Dog, Darius Wolski, The Last Duel, Linus Sandgren, No Time to Die, Dan Lauston, Nightmare Alley, and Bruno Delbonel, The Tragedy of Macbeth. And the Oscar goes to Linus Sandgren for No Time to Die. This movie looked so damn good especially considering the action sequences that were taking place you know shot this on film shot on a lot a lot of imax footage and when you saw it in imax obviously we love imax we're gonna talk about it a lot it looked as good as skyfall you know and skyfall is very artistic and you know obviously roger deakins didn't do this james bond film like he did skyfall but i think linus was a tremendous choice 
he really captured some beautiful imagery imagery right from the get-go i was like this is looks different than any james bond film i've ever seen in my entire life and i think you know greg fraser could have seen winning for dune even the last duel was tremendous all these nominees did a terrific job but i think linus is just was just a little bit above everyone it was a great year for cinematography and all of these films were shot on film except for the last duel but it's a, it was a great year for film like the actual tangible film and but i think that with no time to die greg I mean, linus did something really special it, it it was i think the most stunning looking james bond film um ever and i think it's one of the most beautifully filmed big budget movies of all time it was really stunning from all the different sets to the environments especially that final set i think they did a really terrific job with the cinematography um how the light poured through the different foundations and air levels of that structure i was just blown away from the imagery of this film and the large format was amazing and also the action sequences were so well filmed with um long takes that great one take um big open wide shots so you're, nothing's hidden it's not like shaky handheld you're seeing these giant car chases happen with a huge wide frame really just stunning production next up we have best director the nominees this year are Denis Villeneuve for Dune Paul Thomas Anderson for Licorice Pizza Jane Campion for The Power of the Dog Joel Cohen for The Tragedy of Macbeth Kenneth Branagh for Belfast Guillermo del Toro for Nightmare Alley and Steven Spielberg for West Side Story. And the winner is... Denis Villeneuve for Dune! I bet you all saw this one coming. <laughs> he really did the the standout work this year as a director. Um, the scope of this, the scale of it, um, his precision, his his vision, uh, illustrating what he saw in the book, and it, was, it felt so accurate to the novel. Uh, and it felt like it wasn't just like an adaptation of a book that was just like, oh, the director had fun with it. It felt like, oh, this is what the world of Dune should look like. Everything felt right for it. And the scale of this movie is just monumental. It's enormous. And uh, I mean, it, the fact that he pulled it off once again with the big budget sci-fi film after Blade Runner 2049, it shows him to be really one of the best directors ever. Um, and he, people will be saying that in the next couple of decades. But I think that Dune was the greatest achievement in directing this year. Yeah, I wish people really understood and knew what goes into films like this that are made. I mean, this movie took years to make. You know, when when Legendary got the rights back in 2016 from the Herbert estate, and then Denis was selected almost immediately as soon as he expressed interest in saying that, you know, he's been wanting to make a Dune movie since he was 11, 12 years old the first time he read the book. He's been dreaming of Dune, that's what he says. And so I think that when you watch Dune, you really see the passion and the love of somebody who's not just a great director and filmmaker and artist from Denis, but someone who really loves the story, loves the characters and the worlds that Frank Herbert built and created imaginatively in the books. And I think he really wanted to, to do the novel justice with this film. And again, I can't wait to cover it because a lot went into this movie. And not that all these other movies didn't take a tremendous amount of work from some incredible artists and directors, which are clearly here. But I think Denis just deservedly gets the, the, the Oscar for Dune because of what he accomplished. Again, even Blade Runner 2049, he could have won for that because no one thought anyone could make a sequel to the original. But to make Dune an actual great film... Wow, what a, what a great job. What an impossible task, really. Amazing, amazing. I couldn't imagine any other director doing this. It's a perfect movie. It really is. Isn't it just, is it a movie or is it just a trailer for the it's sequel? It's a trailer for the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> but then they then people freak out over post credit scenes. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. Next up, best actor in a leading role. The nominees are Denzel Washington for The Tragedy of Macbeth, Dev Patel for The Green Knight, Will Smith for King Richard, Javier Bardem for Being the Ricardos, Andrew Garfield for Tick, Tick, Boom, and Matt Damon for The Last Duel. And the winner goes to Will Smith. This man finally won an Oscar because You're welcome, Will. he deserves it. I mean, he's so good in King Richard. I don't think we've ever seen him pull off a character like this before. And this, this list is stacked. Denzel was phenomenal. Dev was great. Javier, Andrew Garfield was really great. Matt Damon, I think, was underrated as hell in The Last Duel, but I think we just got to give it to Will. Yeah, his his um, performance was the what worked for King Richard. 
be, <clears throat> excuse me, because King Richard was a really good movie, but it wasn't great. And he kept it as good as it was. It's because of how how in invested you are in Will Smith. And the character is very interesting. And you have, he brought so many facets, the way he spoke, his mannerisms, uh, this endless positivity. And he just lit up the screen every time he was on screen. And he made the movie really work. Next up, we have Best Actress in a Leading Role. The nominees this year are Jodie Comer for The Last Duel, Zendaya for Malcolm and Marie, Rachel Zegler for West Side Story, Alana Haim for Licorice Pizza, and Tessa Thompson for Passing. Do Nicole Kimmon just in case. Nicole Kimmon for Being the Ricardos, and Tessa Thompson for Passing. And the winner is Jodie Comer for The Last Duel. Unbelievable performance. Bravo. She's really excellent, excellent actor. Uh, she's great in a great TV show called, called Killing Eve. But with this film, she was just such a standout. She had so many layers to her performance. Uh, and she went through hell in this role. And she deserves every award that's available. I don't think she's even getting nominated. I don't think she no. got nominated for Golden Globes. No, I don't see it coming for like the real Academy Awards, which is so unfortunate. I think that this was the best performance of the entire year for any actor, supporting actress, actor. I think Jodie was so terrific. I'd never really seen her or anything. I've seen a couple episodes of that show, but man, she blew me away in this performance. Like you said, so many layers, playing a character from three different perspectives, and you know the irony of the character at the end of the film, how she is sort of basically helpless because of the world that she's living in is just so tragic. And what a performance, what a movie. Jodie Comer, wow, terrific. Congrats, Jodie. All right, now it's time for the final category of the ceremony. Dun, dun, dun. Best picture. Drum the roll. nominees are Dune, West Side Story, The Last Duel, Belfast, Coda, The Tragedy of Macbeth, Licorice Pizza, Nightmare Alley, No Time to Die, and The Green Knight. And the Oscar goes to... Dune! How you doing? Woo! Let's go! All right. You all knew this was coming. It is the best movie of the year. Maybe the best movie of the last few years. And I, 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 We've been talking about it all night with all these awards. You know, it won, what, four awards or something yeah, like that? Yeah, but I mean, awards. again, can't wait to talk about it in depth. This movie's astounding. It's uh, I would exquisite. You know, I usually, that's how you describe food, but this movie's exquisite. Yeah, and the thing is, the Academy always overlooks sci-fi. Unfortunately. For some reason, there's this this attitude towards science fiction that makes people not think that it's worthy of awards or accolades. But, you know, some of the greatest film stories ever told are science fiction. And science fiction is just the same as a musical or like a World War II picture. There's no reason why, you know, a war movie is always more likely to get nominated than a sci-fi movie. It doesn't really make sense when you look at you know, the production, the directing, the acting, the overall film itself is just on another level, really terrific. Uh, it's it the standout of the year. It will be looked back and regarded as one of the best films of the decade, without a doubt. And it was a great year of movies, but still, I, I know you guys know we, we talk this movie up a lot, but it really deserves all the accolades. It's really a remarkable film, a stunning achievement, and this is our best picture of the year. And that wraps our Raiders of the Lost Oscars. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, great job hosting. Hey, great job to you too, man. It was, it was a pleasure to be the first host of this annual ceremony. And Maybe event. we'll get asked to come back next year Hopefully, too. Hopefully. We'll, we'll see. We'll check the mailbox. You yeah. know, can only cross our fingers. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to subscribe. If you're new, hit the like button, leave a comment. Find us on all audio streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find us. Find us on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to check out one of these other videos right here for more content on our favorite films and breaking down all kinds of movie content. Thanks so much.